Hi, this is Absite Review for Liver. Let's start with anatomy. Know that there are eight segments of the liver. Segment one is the caudate lobe, which has separate venous drainage directly into the inferior vena cava and receives portal venous and hepatic artery blood with separate branches. The left lobe of the liver includes segments two, three, and four. Cantley's line is a line that runs from the gallbladder fossa to the IVC and divides the right and left livers. The right liver consists of segments five, six, seven, and eight. The right hepatic vein divides segments seven and eight. The middle hepatic vein divides segments eight and four, and the left hepatic vein divides segments four and two. On ultrasound, the portal veins have a thick wall, whereas the hepatic veins have a thin wall. The right portal vein splits into a right anterior branch to segments five and eight, and a right posterior branch to segments six and seven. Hepatopetal flow is towards the liver, so portal vein has hepatopetal flow. Both of them have P's in the name. Hepatofugal flow is away from the liver, as would be seen in the hepatic veins. Severe cirrhosis, however, can lead to reversal of flow in the portal vein, which means that if you have hepatofugal flow in your portal vein, you're basically effed. Bud-Chiari syndrome is thrombosis of the hepatic vein with classic findings of abdominal pain, hepatomegaly, and ascites. Note that the portal vein has no valves and the normal pressure is three to five millimeters of mercury. The hepatic artery carries about one third of the blood flow to the liver and the portal vein carries about two thirds of the blood flow for the liver, but each of them carry about half of the oxygen. Removal of segments five, six, seven, and eight is a right hepatic hepatectomy, which involves ligation of the right hepatic vein. However, removal of segments four, five, six, seven, and eight is an extended right hepatectomy, otherwise known as a right trisegmentectomy. For this, you would need to ligate the right and middle hepatic veins. Removal of everything to the left of the falciform ligament is technically just a left lateral sectionectomy. A true left hepatectomy removes segments two, three, and four. Any minor liver resection surgery, defined as a right hepatectomy or less, should have a child's A cirrhosis, a bilirubin less than two, no ascites, and platelets over 100,000. The term future liver remnant means how much liver is left behind after a liver resection surgery. In a normal liver, you can have a future liver remnant of 20%, meaning you can remove up to 80% of a normal liver. However, with any cirrhosis, you need to leave a future liver remnant of 40% or more. In order to increase the future liver remnant size, you can use portal vein embolization. You embolize on the side that is going to be removed in order to augment the side that is going to be left behind. For example, if you are going to do an extended right hepatic resection, you should embolize the right portal vein about two to three weeks prior to surgery. And this should lead to about a 10 to 15% increase in the future liver remnant. Here are the major functional questions about the liver that show up on tests frequently. Bile production, toxin metabolism, ammonia metabolism, and glucose balance. Bile is composed of bile acids, which are also known as bile salts, bilirubin, and some other stuff like water and electrolytes. You make about 500 to 1500 cc's a day of bile. Remember that bile acids and salts are different than bilirubin but both are in bile. Bile acids are actually made from cholesterol. The primary bile acids are cholic and candeoxycholic acid. And these are bound to glycine or taurine. And once they are bound, these are actually called bile salts. The bile salts are excreted into the bowel and they help absorb fat and fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. In the gut, bacteria break them back down into secondary bile acids called deoxycholic and lithocholic acids. The enterohepatic circulation is a term that refers largely to bile acids because 95% of bile acids are reabsorbed in the terminal ileum and recirculated through the portal blood back to the liver to start the process all over again. After terminal ileal resection, there is less reabsorption of bile acids, which can lead to diarrhea. The bile acid binder cholestyramine can help bind up bile acids to decrease diarrhea. And because they are made from cholesterol, it is also used to lower cholesterol, 
since more of it is used to replace the lost bile acids. Now, on the other hand, bilirubin is a breakdown of red blood cell heme that becomes biliverdin, then converted to unconjugated bilirubin. Unconjugated or indirect bilirubin is not water soluble and so cannot be excreted from the body. Once bilirubin is conjugated to glucuronic acid via the enzyme glucuronyl acid transferase, it is then considered conjugated or direct bilirubin, which is water soluble and can be excreted in the bile. Note that both bile acids and bilirubin have a conjugation process. Just remember which one is which. Problems with the function of the enzyme glucuronyl acid transferase is called Gilbert syndrome. The process of bilirubin, the processing of bilirubin occurs in the canalicular membrane of the hepatocyte. And if it can't drain, then the alkaline phosphatase is released. So elevated alkphos is the best predictor of biliary obstruction. There are two steps to hepatic metabolism of toxins. Phase one is reduction in oxidation via the CYP450. And the second phase is conjugation to make the compounds more water soluble. Next, the liver converts ammonia to urea via the urea cycle. Cirrhosis leads to an elevated ammonia. This can lead to symptoms like asterixis and cephalopathy. In fact, the most common cause of death in hepatic failure is actually cerebral edema due to this high levels of ammonia. The liver also maintains glucose balance via storage and breakdown of glycogen, production of glucose via gluconeogenesis from branched chain amino acids, and conversion of lactate to glucose via the Cori cycle. Cirrhosis can lead to a high lactate level. Let's make a quick note about the microanatomy of the liver. The portal vein and hepatic artery terminal branches and the bile ducts pretty much always run together. They empty into the edge of the liver lobule. The lobules are all packed together like a honeycomb. In the center of the lobule is the central vein that drains out eventually to the hepatic veins. All of this stuff that the liver does happens between this inflow and outflow of blood, and this space is then called the liver acinus. The acinus is broken down into three zones. Zone one is closest to the portal vein hepatic artery inflow, so it gets good oxygenation. And zone three, which is at the central vein, is farthest from the oxygenated blood. So in hypoxemia, you can see central lobular necrosis, since this is the center of the lobule, which is zone three. The bile duct actually mirror the portal vein hepatic artery anatomy, although they are actually flowing the other way after the bile is produced. Know that the liver function is measured with the child's PUG score. This consists of bilirubin, ascites, albumin, INR, and encephalopathy. Each category has a score of 1 to 3, and child C is 10 to 15 points. If they have child C cirrhosis, they should not have any elective surgery, as it carries about a 50% mortality rate. The MELD score consists of bilirubin, INR, creatinine, and they've also added hemodialysis and serum sodium. Its, its score ranges from six, 6 to 40. You can also get points if you have HCC of the liver. MELD is basically used to prioritize patients for liver transplant. Next, let's talk about portal hypertension. Portal hypertension can cause splenomegaly, which leads to low platelets, and abdominal wall collaterals from the recannulated umbilical vein, which are called caput medusa. The coronary vein can connect to esophageal varices, and the inferior mesenteric vein can connect to superior hemorrhoidal vein, which causes internal hemorrhoids, which can bleed profusely. Other clinical signs of portal hypertension on CT scan include ascites, an enlarged caudate lobe, periportal collaterals, and splenomegaly. Tips is used for refractory ascites and esophageal variceal bleeding, and also as a bridge to transplant. However, since blood rushes through the tips without any hepatic metabolism, it can worsen encephalopathy and is contraindicated in right heart failure. The one-year patency rate of a tips is only 50%. Let's 
talk about liver infections. Pyogenic liver abscesses occur most commonly after infections in the biliary tree, such as cholangitis. Other sources are peptic ulcers, pyelonephritis, or diverticulitis. Pyogenic liver abscesses present with right upper quadrant pain, fevers, and signs of systemic infection. They have a 10 to 20% mortality rate, which is higher than the other infections of the liver. If they are less than two centimeters in size, use antibiotics alone. If they are greater than two centimeters in size, you probably should use an IR drain and antibiotics. Next, amoebic liver abscesses come from the colon infection with entamoeba histolytica. This is transmitted via the fecal oral route and is usually presented in somebody with recent travel from south of the border somewhere. It is diagnosed via serum antigens to the E. histolytica. It's not diagnosed by stool culture. It has a target sign on CT scan showing an edematous rim around it. Most all amoebic liver abscess can be treated with flagell alone. The contents of the abscess are often described as anchovy paste. Next, echinococcal liver cyst. It commonly presents in patients from Central and South America, especially if they worked in a meat processing facility. It comes from echinococcus granulosus. This is also known as hydatid liver disease. The best way to test for it in the old days was a Cassoni skin test, but now we just do serum testing for the hydatid antigens. If the hydatid cyst looks entirely calcified without septations, this means it is inactive. You can watch and wait on these. Active infections, though, show a large parent cyst with septations and often numerous peripheral daughter cysts and maybe just a few areas of calcification. To treat active echinococcal disease, always start with albendazole or mebendazole, and this is used for about one month before and after any interventions also. Cysts less than five centimeters in size could probably just get treated with medication alone. If a cyst is over five centimeters in size, it is likely to rupture, or it is not responding well to medical therapy, then you should consider invasive therapies. PAIR stands for percutaneous aspiration, injection with a sclerosing agent like alcohol or hypertonic saline, and reaspiration. Many of the tests say don't do a percutaneous biopsy of a chenococcal cyst due to anaphylaxis. This is actually pretty rare, so if you are giving albendazole and doing a percutaneous pair procedure, it is unlikely the patient will get anaphylaxis, but you should probably mention it and know that it is a possibility. Percutaneous pair is good for unilocular active cysts without connections to the biliary tree. You should not do pair if there is a connection to the biliary tree since it could sclerose the bile ducts themselves. Pair is also not good for multilocular cysts. Surgical treatment after pretreatment with albendazole is the best thing for multilocular or big cysts that are close to the surface or if the cyst has a biliary or other fistula connection and if the patient presents with a ruptured cyst. Ruptured cysts often do present with anaphylaxis. If you are operating on an echinococcal cyst, this is when you should say you would pack the surgical field with laps soaked in hypertonic saline and be careful not to spill the contents of the cyst. Lastly, schistosomiasis or liver flukes are worms that can clog up the portal vein branches causing pre-sinusidal portal hypertension as opposed to cirrhosis which is considered sinusidal hi portal hypertension. Schistosomiasis is treated with praziquantel. Okay, let's talk about benign liver masses. First, focal nodular hyperplasia or FNH is seen as a bright arterial enhancement on arterial phase CT with classically a central scar that remains hypoattenuating. These are formed as a result of in utero vascular malformations. These have Kupfer cell hyperplasia, so an FNH will light up on liver sulfur colloid scan. Next, hepatic adenomas usually occur in women and they're usually on some sort of oral contraceptive or steroid use. About 80% of hepatic adenomas are asymptomatic. If you find an adenoma in a woman and she is on OCPs, stop them, and if the adenoma goes away entirely, you are done. If the adenoma does not go away entirely, most people say that you should surgically resect any adenoma now. 
This is because the risk of rupture and bleeding is the greatest risk, and there's also a very low risk of actual cancer in adenomas. The beta-catenin subtype of hepatic adenoma is associated more with the risk of malignancy, though. There is typically no uptake, meaning these are cold on sulfur colloid scan. This is one way to differentiate them from FNH, which tend to be hot or have uptake on, F on sulfur colloid scan. The other benign lesion of the liver commonly seen is hemangiomas. On CT scan, these have progressive peripheral enhancement with centripetal fill-in. These typically do not need any intervention, unless they are very symptomatic, in which case you can just enucleate them. Know that the Kassebach merritt syndrome is a giant liver hemangioma in children, which can also cause consumptive thrombocytopenia. Next, let's talk about malignant liver tumors. We'll start with HCC. The most common cancer in the world is actually hepatocellular cancer, or HCC. Hepatitis B infections are endemic in many Asian countries, and you can develop HCC without cirrhosis if you have hepatitis B. If you've been vaccinated against Hep B, you will have high Hep B surface antibodies. In the US, most people with HCC have cirrhosis though. Causes of cirrhosis include chronic Hep C, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or NASH, and alcohol, which is also called Lenex cirrhosis. Other specific risk factors for HCC include alcohol, smoking, primary sclerosing cholangitis, hemochromatosis, and aflatoxin, which is a toxin from moldy peanuts. If somebody has cirrhosis, you should screen them for HCC with Q six-month liver ultrasounds and serum AFP levels. False elevated AFP could come from non-seminoma, testicular cancer, the cirrhosis itself, and a pregnancy. A CT for HCC shows arterial enhancement with rapid washout, and it's graded with a system called the LIRAD system, which is similar to the BIRAD for breast. So a LIRAD 4 or 5 liver lesion in a cirrhotic patient can basically be assumed to be an HCC, especially if the AFP is also elevated. This is a treatment algorithm for HCC. So HCC is resected in child's A and B cirrhotics if they can have enough functional liver remnant. However, once a patient has decompensated liver cirrhosis uh, and child C cirrhosis, and they have hepatocellular cancer, then they should be strongly considered for liver transplant as the treatment. Criteria for liver transplant for HCC are known as the Milan criteria. This is one tumor less than five centimeters in size, or three tumors, none larger than three centimeters in size. If the patient is not a surgical candidate with hepatocellular cancer, then they can also have transarterial chemoembolization, which is TACE. That can be done as just bland embolization, meaning you're just blocking the blood flow into the tumor, or with radioactive beads. Hepatocellular cancer preferentially receives blood from the arterial side, which is why transarterial embolization works really well. You can also do a taste and also portal vein embolization on the same side if surgery does become an option. A variant of HCC is the fibrolamellar variant. This occurs more in young people with a median age of only 25 years old. Fibrolamellar occurs in non cirrhotic patients. They typically have no hepatitis and very commonly have normal AFP levels. Distinguishing fibrolamellar HCC from FNH is tough since both of them have central scars on imaging. However, the central scar on FNH enhances our arterial phase where it does not do this in fibrolamellar. Resect fibrolamellar when able because it has a better prognosis than regular HCC. The other indications for liver resection would be intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas. Cholangiocarcinoma can be intrahepatic it can be extrahepatic, extrapancreatic, which is usually at the bifurcation, called a Klatskin's tumor. About 60% of all cholangiocarcinomas are actually these Klatskin tumor types. For a Klatskin's, you would do a bile duct excision with a Rui hepaticojejunostomy. The third type is an extrahepatic, intrapancreatic cholangiocarcinoma, which would get a Whipple surgery. Intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma tends to be infiltrative masses 
They tend to look hypoattenuating on CT scan and they run along the biliary radicals. They can be very difficult to get negative margins and they typically have a poor outcome. Transplant is rarely offered for these. Other reasons to do liver resection for metastatic disease would be colorectal cancers, sarcoma, melanoma, and neuroendocrine tumors. Metastatic disease to the liver is actually the most common liver tumor. As opposed to HCC, which is hypervascular, metastatic disease tends to be unenhancing dark spots on CT. You can't do liver transplant for metastatic cancer, mainly because the required immune suppression leads to explosive recurrent cancer everywhere, so it's not really worth it. All right, that's it. I hope that helps.